Hey folks, this is Riker, and while we've all been testing the massive Diablo 4 changes on the test server, the season theme has leaked, and everyone's guesses were wrong about it. We'll go over the data mine details that WoW had found, we'll also cover the new mystery in Helldivers 2 that has everyone excited, and what the Tekken series producer said to get an entire generation pissed off at him. But we'll start with the Diablo 4 buzz that finally has people excited about the game again. In case you don't know, the test server began this week for the massive changes coming to the game in Season 4. And if you need to be caught up with anything related to Diablo 4, you can check out my website, Riker.com, where I have all my videos related to the latest Diablo 4 news posted. In fact, that leads us to our sponsor, Squarespace. I built my website, Riker.com, using Squarespace, and I was able to do everything myself quickly and easily and with zero education in the field, all thanks to how easy Squarespace is to work with. Watch how easily I updated the Diablo 4 section of my website to include my latest videos. Squarespace is flexible for any kind of website, with tons of templates that you can easily customize to your needs, no knowledge of coding required. And with their new Fluid Engine, it's easier than ever. You just drag and drop elements to move and resize them. You can even set up a custom merch shop with Squarespace now. You just design your products, and they handle production, inventory, and shipping all the stuff that you don't want to have to deal with yourself. Basically, if you want to build a website, I recommend Squarespace. It's the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. Stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything. Your products, content you create, even your time. And Squarespace is offering my viewers 10% off your first purchase with them. Just go to squarespace.com slash Riker or click the link in the description to start your free trial and start building your online presence. That's squarespace.com slash R-H-Y-K-K-E-R and use code Riker to get started today. But back to Diablo 4. While playing on the test server, I noticed during the Helltides, when I would complete a Whisper, I'd see a little pop-up say, plus 300 Wolf's Honor. And I'm wondering, Wolf's Honor? Well, that's not a thing. No dev has ever talked about this. It's not in the game already. It's not covered in the patch notes and nothing in the test server seems to interact with this either. But then I also noticed that, among all the new things in Helltide, is friendly mercenaries fighting monsters. They wield sword and shield, they cast elemental magic at enemies, and they're dressed just like the Iron Wolves from Diablo 2. The Iron Wolves also appeared in Diablo 3 under a different appearance, and then in Diablo 4 under yet another appearance, so now they're back to this sort of classic Diablo 2 appearance. So, Wolf's Honor, Iron Wolves? Not a stretch to say that these two are connected. So I started to think that this must be related to the new season theme. Again, we don't know what the season 4 theme is. It wasn't revealed yet. All the changes that we're trying out, all of that, it's just coming to the base game forever. But while the devs tried to hide the theme from us in the test server to leave it as a surprise for season 4 itself, there may have been some stuff either they forgot to take out or they simply couldn't take out maybe because they were tied into the new Helltide system. Originally, people were speculating on Season 4 that it's going to be zombies or honestly any number of things generally monstrous that definitely was not Iron Wolves. No one predicted Iron Wolves. But then Wowhead came out with some juicy data mines that actually found a bunch of stuff in-game tied to Iron Wolves, suggesting that they may be strongly tied to the season theme. First off, this here is the old Iron Wolves logo. This is from the Book of Tyrael. This icon here was data mined. And this looks a hell of a lot like a modernized version of that old Iron Wolf logo. Wowhead also found this Iron Wolf minimap icon with a little green leaf on it. And that green leaf has always been used for seasonal content. They also data mined a bunch of Iron Wolf reputation cash rewards, similar to the seasonal cash rewards we generally get. And to be clear, Data mine content is just stuff that is found in the game files. It's new, it's been brought in, at least this content is new and has been brought in with the, the PTR. It doesn't necessarily mean this will be definitely in the game in Season 4, or even ever. For instance, Diablo 3 had assets hidden within it that were only used like 10 seasons down the line, and some assets were never used at all because they were part of systems that were scrapped during development. But that said, unless the devs are deliberately trolling us, I think betting on a season link to the Iron Wolves is a safe bet right now. 
Wowhead also data mined some of the cosmetic rewards for the seasonal battle pass. Not the models themselves, but the splash images for them. I'm getting a very unique druid, regal, flower, hippie vibe from some of them. Almost makes you think of the Scovos Isles, in fact. I'm not sure why. It gives me a kind of a Scovos vibe. Or maybe even vaguely elven in influence. And then for the other cosmetics, we're seeing this sort of dichotomy between heavenly and more hellish looking weapons. They all seem to depict angelic beings with wings on them, even the eviler looking ones. But some of them are kind of like fire imbued. Others seem more heavenly. And again, then others retain that sort of natural druid flower vibe. But they also have skulls on them, so it's it's kind of like Dia de los Muertos, in fact. So could we be looking here at demonic, angelic, and ancestral items? This was a system that the devs originally had early in development. Gear that either could be tied to the faction of hell, to heaven, or to humanity. Now the thing is, I don't see any obvious connections to the Iron Wolves anywhere here. You can argue that the hellish cosmetics may represent Helltide. So... Could we be getting a Heaven Tide event in Season 4 as well? Will we see followers of Anarius come up as a threat to face off? Or will the gates of Heaven themselves open up and Imperius, uh, Archangel of Valor, will come down with an army of angels ready to wipe out humanity once and for all? Now that last one there, Imperius's Revenge, I think that will happen one day. At some point in Diablo's story, but that's a really major event. I don't think it's going to happen as part of just a season theme. Maybe an expansion, maybe even Diablo 5, but not a season theme. So then my theory became, okay, we're actually seeing a combination of cosmetics here. The Heaven Hell cosmetics, that's the Battle Pass. But then the Earthly Druid Elven cosmetics, that's going to be for the next holiday event. Season 4 is going to be running May, June, July. And June is when we have Midsummer. So this kind of has a summary look to it right these cosmetics in fact i bet they're going to have a midsomar event that's they're going to call it right midsomar and they're probably going to channel that sort of like weird evil hippie energy from that ari aster horror film the thing is wowhead's data mining has all of these listed as season four battle pass stuff so that kind of kills my theory about it being tied to a midsomar event so I think where that leaves me now is that I think the, the hippie items, they're probably going to be the free track cosmetics, and then the Heaven Hell stuff will be on the paid track. Generally, from past seasons, the free track cosmetics had nothing to do with the season theme. So, if we're still trying to guess what the season theme is, we should just focus on the Heaven Hell stuff, if all the theories are lining up. Uh, but yeah, speculating on that, again, I don't really know where to take the speculation so i'm tossing the ball in your court now folks sound off in the comments where can we take these theories what do we think season four is going to be about but it didn't even end there folks there have been some developments on ptr in the lost city of yura this is a zone that exists within diablo 4 yura is this lost city within the lore of diablo and in game in diablo 4 in the live version of the game right now you have this little zone and it seems like a place where more could be built. Just north of this zone, there's a whole empty space in the map, and we've speculated since the game's launch that one day we'll be able to access the lost city of Yura, and a development has happened on the PTR. We see now that this little path to the north has now opened up, and we can travel a little further north down to this staircase that goes to nowhere. We also see this little area to the north this little nook now has what appears to be some kind of a vendor stall like maybe for some kind of a seasonal event or a holiday event the path heading north seems to end in a place where we might see uh, a, an interactable to head down into a dungeon or a new zone i'm not sure what else to make of this but it is an exciting development and good on wowhead for spotting it and meanwhile let's talk some more about how the test server has been going the short answer is uh, really good I'm seeing tons of positivity for the changes, and really no negativity. Overall, this is a big win for the game. I mean, at the end of the day, some people just are never going to like Diablo 4, and, and that's okay. It's not going to become an entirely different game, but it is correcting some of the biggest issues that people have had with the game. For people that feel like they could like Diablo 4 if certain changes were made, we're there now. The new Codex of Power is an absolute win. Not having to manage aspects anymore is a breath of fresh air. 
my stash is basically just empty now, and I, I'm a hoarder. Anyway, there's so much quality of life built into the codex. Uh, you got search functions, you got sort functions, favorite functions. Helltide now is so fun. A lot of the best mechanics from Season 2 and Season 3 overworld events have been built into Helltide. There's so many different things that happen in Helltide, like giant worms will pop out of the ground and spew demons at you. Also, they increase the pickup radius on cinders, meaning less backtracking or going out of your way to grab them. They'll just zoop to you if you get close enough. Uh, Helltide again is now available earlier in, in the game. World Tier 1 and 2, you get a nerf version of Helltide, and this now seems to be the fastest way to level your character. No more running the stupid Donheim dopamine tunnels over and over. Helltide is now the most efficient leveling method, it seems, which is great because it's also the most fun. And that's what you want. You want the most efficient thing to line up with the most fun thing. Because when the most efficient thing is something that is not fun, that is when you have a problem. People have been finding goblin packs, like in Diablo 3. Those are always fun to run into, and I look forward to finding my own in Diablo 4. I haven't found one yet. Uh, especially now that goblins have also been buffed with their drops. They can drop more interesting things, uber boss materials. In general, you can find uber boss materials in many more random places in the world without having to uh, do something very specific to grind for them. They've optimized town layouts so that vendors are clustered together to make our trips to town less tedious. The Pit, the new endgame system, lots of fun. It's basically Diablo 3 Greater Rifts with some improvements. They didn't try to reinvent the wheel here. They just took the lessons learned in Diablo 3 and just stuck with them. Happy to see that. Necromancer minion builds are looking really strong now. Uh, then Bone Spear Necro can work like Diablo 3's Bone Spear Necro with your skeleton mages pumping out their own spears that do more damage on your own spears because minions are so strong. People have been finding absolutely wild, broken build combinations with all the new tempered affixes and uniques and aspects. You can customize your skills so much via tempering. It's uh, one of the new crafting things. You can like make your skill radius bigger. You can make skills fire multiple projectiles or pierce more enemies. Sorcerers can spam the screen full of frozen orbs. Barbarians can literally obscure the entire screen with dust devils. I'm sure the crazy OP stuff will get nerfed before the season launches. This is the point of the PTR to find this stuff now. Because, yeah, some of the stuff is too crazy, too over the top. But overall, what we're seeing, especially with tempering, is we're opening up a lot of more really fun combinations. Another thing we're seeing, it seems it'll be faster than ever to reach level 100 in Season 4. But... Then starts the real gear grind. It may take dozens to hundreds of hours to fully gear out your character in perfectly tempered, perfectly masterworked gear. Given all the materials you're going to need to farm and all the RNG you'll need to contend with. And what I am hoping is that this is not a system where the average player will feel like I need to have all my gear perfected. Because if that is how the average player will feel, we're going to be in a bad state of affairs. What I am hoping is that we have a system where the super hardcore blaster players who want to chase that can chase that and have that keep them engaged with the game in the long term. But then the more casual players will be like, yeah, that's way too much. And for the amount of time and effort, it's not that good. I don't have to perfect all my stuff. I could engage with the system. Right? I could, uh, especially tempering, I can engage with tempering, I can engage with masterworking, but it's okay if my stuff isn't perfect. It's good enough, and I am satisfied, and I'm not going to go complain that it takes too long to masterwork and, and, and all that. I, I hope that we're able to reach that point of balance. A parallel I would make is to Diablo 3, right? Where you have the blasters that are getting thousands of paragons by the end of the season, but we never really reached a position where the average player was like, oh, it takes too long to level my Paragon. I can't max out my Paragon. Others are so far ahead. We we reached a point where everyone was kind of okay with things. A lot of the casual players were like, eh, my Paragon is enough. I am okay with how far I'm pushing. So between tempering and masterworking, what we have now overall is the best crafting system we've ever seen in a Diablo game. Not in ARPGs in general, we have deeper and more crafting options in other games, but for Diablo, you know, this is this is the best we've achieved so far, and there's room for expansion as well, based off of this. 
One, I don't know if it's really a criticism, but uh, Veiled Crystals, it's a more of a balance thing. Veiled Crystals right now seem to be maybe a bit problematic. A lot of different things in the game require Veiled Crystals. So it's going to be a big bottleneck to a lot of your different crafting activities. Farming them is harder now because rares drop less often with the whole Loot 2.0 stuff. So we might need Veiled Crystals to drop more often. We might need the Veiled, veiled crystal cost of things to be dropped as well, but that's all stuff that can be easily solved before Season 4's launch. Then some other things, a lot of people appreciate the ability to zoom out the camera further. If you want a good comparison of what that looks like, WoW had put together this nifty tool here. This little slider, and again this is an option, you don't have to be more zoomed out if you don't want to. Another small change that is appreciated, you can now customize your character's hairstyle and color in the wardrobe after you've created your character. Yes, you're not locked into the same hairstyle. You can actually go to the barber. Now, one bit of feedback I'm seeing a lot, and I do agree with, is that items with greater affixes need to be more easily visually distinguished. At Endgame, all you care about is gear with greater affixes. And while they do have a little Roman numeral appended to the end of them when they drop, it's not immediately obvious. You can kind of get lost in the clutter. And once it's in your inventory, there's no way to tell at a glance. You have to mouse over the items to see these. The good news is that the devs have said they are working on something here. Then, by the same token, Uber Uniques? They should probably have something to visually distinguish them from regular Uniques. Maybe the big red primal beam from D3 with the big drop sound right now. You know, if a player isn't tuned into the community, they might get a Shaco and not even realize that it's like an uber unique drop. But in general though, where we are right now is that we actually might be in a Diablo 4 is saved state. The game is fixed. A lot of the core issues that we've complained about have been addressed. And now, I think it's just about building on this foundation. Instead of fixing things that weren't doing what they ought to be doing, we can now be adding more content, which is all stuff that will be addressing a, a whole slew of other complaints that people have, right? If anything that's like, we don't have enough to do, well, that's solved by adding things. Adding things is easier to do than reworking the foundation of the house, right? You can keep adding floors, but it's hard to do that when you're still shuffling about in the basement and digging around under the foundation. What's clear is that the devs have been listening to the community feedback since the very beginning, and they've clearly been trying to address all of our biggest pain points with the game. Again, you can check out my video on my full first impressions with the test server where I dig deeper into all these systems and as well the biggest one, the itemization rework, which I barely spoke about in this video here. Now, talking about hell, crazy stuff is happening in Helldivers 2 as well. Hours after we liberated Malevolon Creek, in record time no less, thanks to all the veterans of the creek who haven't left since day one, some players began to spot mysterious, ominous ships in the sky over automaton worlds. Some describe the ships as being cloaked, but I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, we can see them. If you can see it, it's not cloaked. Eh. Uh, they're certainly dark. You can see their shadows, but again, something cloaked would suggest you really can't see it at all, but I think it's really just a perspective thing. These ships are really big and they're more distant, so we're not seeing them as well as our own ships. They're just much more massive. But some people were speculating that these were cloaked Illuminate ships. That's the third faction we haven't seen yet. They're highly advanced aliens. We know they're going to come one day because they're in the first game. But then people started to see that these ships were firing red lasers at our ships. Illuminate laser technology is blue. We've spoken about Illuminates before and how we've seen mysterious blue lasers killing Helldivers. Automatons are the ones who shoot the red lasers, so these are probably automaton ships. And they kind of coincided with the addition of some new automaton tech as well. We saw this week the introduction of flying automaton gunships. Because that's what we needed, things that can shoot and fly. And the automatons also now have friggin' AT-ATs, like the giant Star Wars Imperial Walkers. And we don't have any of those cable ties to trip up their legs. These automatons are called Factory Striders, and they're quite literally mobile factories that poop out more automatons, and also shoot back at you with multiple guns, and they're nearly indestructible. Now our newest major order, at least as of the time of this recording, in response to all of this is eliminate 
the automatons. Like, just, just all of them. Just forever. Destroy them. But, since we know this is a video game, obviously the devs won't just eliminate a faction for the rest of the game's life, so... Is this mission doomed to fail, no matter what? Well, that would kind of suck to give us a major order that we literally can't beat, so... Assuming we can win, what happens if we do? Do the automatons disappear for a while and then re-emerge in the future? That's a possibility. Maybe in the meantime, that's when we get the introduction of the Illuminate while the automatons are gone. Or, once we have rid the galaxy of those nasty robots, will the galaxy map zoom out and then we suddenly see that we are surrounded by a giant automaton army. There has been lore in the game about the automaton sending out a signal into deep space and they're preparing to retake Cyberstan. Now we also got this week a patch that introduced ballast changes to missions, stratagems, weapons, enemies, and even Helldivers. They added two new planetary hazards, blizzards and sandstorms. They halved the negative effect of operation modifiers that increase stratagem cooldowns or call-in times, thank goodness. They nerfed the damage that chargers normal melee attacks do to exosuits. They nerfed the damage that bile spewers and nursing viewers do with their puke. Shriekers no longer create bug breaches, and their corpses no longer auto-kill anything it lands on. They gave the Liberator Penetrator a full auto mode. They gave the Railgun a nice little charge meter next to its scope. No more accidentally exploding yourself in an unsafe mode now. They buffed the anti-material rifle's damage by 30%. Nice. They increased the Dominator's damage by 50%, as well as its stagger. Pretty significant there. But they also reduced the damage, stagger, and demolition force of the Slugger. Big nerf overall to this one. Seems relationship with Slugger has ended, relationship with Dominator has begun. According to a dev on the Discord, the reason for the Slugger nerf was actually because the Slugger was, hands down, the best sniper rifle in the game. Now. If you're not intimately familiar with Helldivers 2, you might wonder, well, what's wrong with it being the best sniper rifle in the game? Well, what's wrong is that it's a shotgun. But here's the thing. The nerfs they made to the Slugger make it a worse shotgun, not a worse sniper rifle. Why not nerf how quickly its damage drops off from range, or nerf its accuracy? You're nerfing its stopping power, you're nerfing its ability to stagger enemies. It's almost just as effective of a sniper rifle as it was. And if the Slugger is the best sniper rifle, then doesn't that say more about the state of sniper rifles? They also buffed how much damage fire does per tick, fire from any source, uh, any weapon, by a whopping 50%. This is a huge buff, and I'm not sure they fixed the fire damage bug along with it. You see, players seem to have figured out that if you are not the game host, fire damage over time that you deal does basically no damage. It's just bugged. And this has led to a lot of people thinking a lot of the fire-based weapons were crap. Now I wonder if the devs saw how underutilized fire weapons were and buffed them significantly, meaning now for the host, they'll be crazy strong. They also buff the ballistic shield by making it block a bigger area and expose less of your body. And they fixed a bug that actually made part of your body become vulnerable while using the shield in first person. I'm starting to hear some positive buzz about the ballistic shield now, so hopefully, hopefully you can rise out of the garbage tier that pretty much everyone seemed to decide it was in. The devs also said that they're looking into fixing the misaligned scopes on many weapons the arc thrower misfiring, and the spear not locking on correctly. They do want to fix all of these things, but they said it's going to take some time. Another nice change that came with this patch, once you complete a mission and return to your ship, you remain covered in any blood and guts you had on you. I really like coming back from a mission looking like I just went through war. The accumulation of blood and guts is like a badge of honor. That said, we should also have like a cleaning station on the ship. Or at least an option to turn off this effect, because not everyone likes it, and it is a bit silly to keep remaining on your ship in these blood and guts. Like, just, you know, you're, you're in the middle of your duty, you're having meetings, no one's got a towel. With this patch, we also got an increase in the level cap, from 50 to a whopping 150. And if you were previously at the cap of 50, the game did keep trap of your XP. So people logged in and they're like, oh wow, I just jumped like tens of levels. Of course, there's a bunch of new titles that we can now earn. Titles of increasing satirical ridiculousness like Admirable Admiral and Ten Star General. 
But the last two titles you can earn, at level 140, you can get the title of Private, and at level 150, Super Private. This is clearly a reference to Starship Troopers. Sergeant Zim was Johnny Rico's drill instructor. He's the one who got himself demoted to the rank of Private so that he could be deployed on the battlefield against the bugs. Basically, in the real military, you don't send generals onto the front lines of battle. These are meant to be your best tactical minds. You don't want them to die by a stray bullet. So the game is basically saying that the greatest and most noble Helldivers are those that love Super Earth so much that they would demote themselves down to the rank of private so they could continue to fight the good fight. We also got this week the announcement of the next War Bond, the Democratic Detonation Premium War Bond, which is explosion themed. It'll add the Adjudicator Rifle, an armor penetrating assault rifle, the Eruptor Rifle, a bolt action sniper rifle that explodes shrapnel in all directions, the Exploding Crossbow, which fires a projectile affected by gravity, the Thermite Grenade, which will stick to an enemy and burn them over time, the grenade pistol, yep, it is exactly what you think it is. You do gotta reload it between every shot, but holy crap, this will finally replace my redeemer. Now I can just plug bug holes with my secondary instantly on my wish list. There's also gonna be the expert extraction pilot booster. That's gonna lower the time needed for extraction. Then there's gonna be armor, and if I had to guess, the armor is going to reduce damage versus explosions or versus fire or both. The War Bond releases on April 11th. As a reminder, these battle passes never expire. You can take five years to complete them if you want, and you can farm all the premium currency just by playing the game. And the design philosophy of the devs is horizontal progression, not vertical. In other words, their goal isn't to introduce more powerful weapons, they just want us to have a variety of equally good options, but that each option has its own specific usage case. Meanwhile, Path of Exile has been going through an absolute roller coaster. The previous expansion was a winner. Arguably the best expansion the game has ever seen. Tons and tons of people were really happy about it. And as it came to a close, players were sad to learn that the League mechanic would not make it into the core game. But then, Prior to launching its latest expansion, Necropolis, the constant quality of life teasers had fans absolutely hype for Necropolis. But then, a controversial change, removing the ability to bind left-click to instant skills, had players upset. Down again. But then, the reveal of the League mechanic had them hype once more. Down and up and down and up. Then the expansion launched last Friday and... Down again. Initial impressions of the expansion were negative. Players were saying that the new crafting system was tedious, too complex, too reliant on RNG, the interface was cumbersome, the mechanic was too difficult and not rewarding enough, and worst of all, it was not a mechanic that you could opt out of and only interact with it when you choose to, you were always subjected to the increased difficulty. Player retention charts on PoEDB aligned with player sentiment. Necropolis was losing players at a faster rate than any expansion tracked on the database. But then? GGG released a blog post titled What We're Working On, and contained within was a list of changes that looked like it could have been a collective community wish list. Too much RNG? Well, now you can select the base type of item you want to craft. Huge win. Overall, there were just a bunch of big buffs to the crafting mechanic, quality of life improvements, basically everything the community complained about within the couple of days since the league launched, all that was addressed, completely turning things around. And most astonishingly of all, in record time, they released the patch less than one week into the expansion, basically saving the league. Now, not all devs do things to make people happy. Sometimes they'll say some things that piss people off. For instance, in an interview with IGN, the Tekken series producer, Katsuhiro Harada, was asked about how 1v1 fighting games can evolve into the future. And his answer? The genre needs to work in more team-based game modes because he feels that the younger generation of gamers are more drawn to team games. That sounds very sensible. But his reasoning may not be what you think. Why are those younger generation of gamers more drawn to team games? Well, he said, quote, In Japan, and probably in most of the world, my generation is a big one. It makes up a good chunk of the population. That made our society a competitive one. If you applied to a school or for a job, there was always a lot of competition. Because of this, people in my generation prefer definitive outcomes, a clear winner and loser. This applies to folks in and around their 50s. But most young people nowadays are the opposite. 
they're rarely eager to engage in one-on-one -on -one showdowns. Plus, because fighting games pit you by yourself against a single opponent, you have to accept all the responsibility if you lose. You can't blame anyone else. In team-based shooters, when players win, they can say that they won because of their own contributions. But when they lose, it's because they got matched with a lousy team. So basically, he's saying that younger people prefer team games because they can't take responsibility for their own actions or abilities. Just deflect the blame. And honestly, I don't think he's that far off from the mark. At least on a personal note, I don't enjoy 1v1 games. I am a tryhard. If I do a 1v1, I'm going to be hyper competitive about it. I'm going to want to do my best. I'm going to put a ton of pressure on myself to perform. And if I screw up, if I make mistakes, I'm going to be really hard on myself about it. And it, that's just not the kind of experience that I want in my recreational activities when I just want to unwind and have fun. And I know people are going to say, well, just don't feel that way. I, I can't turn off that hyper competitive side of me. But if you put me in a team game, if my teammates are being hyper competitive, if they're just having fun, then I can just have fun. And it's not about blaming them if we lose. It's just that a lot of it is out of my control. So losing doesn't feel as bad because I don't have to be as hard on myself. Not that I'm blaming them, but I just, I don't feel like, oh, it's not because I screwed up kind of thing. And besides, I'm having a good time with my friends anyway. It's a shared experience, whether it's celebrating victory together or commiserating over defeat. Now, if you put me in a team game with a bunch of randoms in a highly competitive setting, well, there's a reason I hated team sports as a kid. Because when you're playing defense and you let their attackers through, you let your whole team down, and that's a lot of pressure too. Now, for some people, 1v1 is actually less pressure because of that, because they're not performing in front of an audience or their peers, and they feel like they're being judged. Also, though, everything he was saying about there being a lot of competition when he was young, like for jobs, I mean, has he seen the modern job market? It's still highly competitive. Now, maybe you can argue in the past there was more of a culture of competition, of being the best and trying to beat other people into a job position, and maybe nowadays we don't have that fierce competitive culture anymore. Now everyone gets a participation trophy, as a lot of people like to say. And, you know, you probably wouldn't be wrong about that. But I think the bigger factor here is that games have just evolved over time. In the past, games were, on average, challenging. And part of the reason for that was monetization. The more you lose, the more quarters you can sink into the arcade machine to keep playing, so devs were incentivized to make their games hard. Back then, it was always an accomplishment to have beat a game. You used to talk about games like, hey, I beat Prince of Persia. No one talks about games like that anymore, outside of outliers like Dark Souls and similar games like that. Gaming just opened up to a wider audience by becoming less about a challenge to overcome and more about just being an experience. And with the internet becoming widespread, a lot of games became social experiences. Instead of being a game of tennis, games became hanging out at a bar with either your friends or just meeting new people at the bar. Maybe you throw some darts, maybe you shoot some pool, but everyone's just really there to have some drinks. So I don't think the core here is that younger people want to shift blame, even if there may be some truth to that. I think it's just that the audience of people seeking a hyper-competitive experience is vastly smaller than the audience of people who are just looking to share an experience with a group of people. But what do you folks think about all that? Sound off in the comments with your thoughts. And that's going to wrap up this video. But do be sure to have checked out last week's video in which we discussed the controversial change that Blizzard recently made. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more gaming content.